uh, we had done a study and you may want to look at this study uh, where we had calculated the life cycle greenhouse gas impacts of a coal based power plant and if we wanted to instead of coal if we wanted to import natural gas um, through the LNG uh, basically liquefied natural gas import it from the US look at the entire life cycle of that and then see what happens in terms of the CO2 point of view. So, if we look at this you we find that in the Indian context the most of the as we saw most of it is uh, in the power plant itself very similar to the man and spat study here we got it as 1082 kg CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour. Mine to plant has something coming in with the mining in the, in the, at mining the CH4 uh, emissions uh, fugitive emissions at the mine diesel and electricity use at the mine and the transport. So, this accounts for just 59 uh, grams of uh, <coughs> 59 grams per kilowatt hour or 59 kg per megawatt hour. And uh, so, so, this gives you a sort of break up um, just from the uh, this is cradle to the gate kind of ca calculation. And uh, if we look at a similar kind of thing for the if we wanted to use imported natural gas, we find that the power plant accounts for much lower the total comes down from 1000 to about 585. Here the well to power plant is significant of which it starts with the this is where they are looking at hydraulic fracturing and flow back the production of the oil and then processing the transmission in the US liquefaction shipping regasification that adds much more than the mine to um, mine to the well uh, as in the coal case where we started from coal mining to the power plant that was very small this is much higher but then the actual operation is much lower so overall it turns out to be less. Uh, we also saw based on this we made a distribution of the actual um, uh, CO2 emissions for the coal fleet of the India of India and you can see very clearly that the mean is around this there are some plants which are uh, for, which are more efficient maybe there are the supercritical ones and there are some which are operating with a much uh, poorer emission record. And in the case of natural gas, if we had this kind of distribution, you can see that the mean would be much lower than this. So, this gives you an idea of what are the kind of GHG emissions for the power sector and how we can look at it from a uh, energy point of view. Uh, when we look at energy return on investment, there is a recent uh, paper in Nature Energy which you may want to look at. Uh, which uh, calculates the EROI and uh, shows EROI for different kinds of different sources uh, including renewables. So, we can look at the energy uh, uh, EROI based on primary will be whatever energy is used in the extraction and the production, um, but we can also look at the energy embodied and used in transmission and distribution and the final energy. So, finally, if we look at this as the framework, the uh, EROI values that we would get would be lower than that we have we would get only if we looked at the primary. So, if we see this, this paper shows <coughs> the EROI primary and the EROI final and uh, you can see over a period of time that uh, the EROIs have been coming down and the final EROIs we are talking of are of the order of about uh, 30 or so which is also a pretty high number. Uh, this is a summary of different uh, studies uh, EROI estimates and you can see here uh, that <coughs> the EROI estimates uh, show um, if for electricity city for photovoltaics the EROI final which we are talking of are of the order of 6 to 20 
again depending on the different kinds of studies and the different kinds of uh, estimates and assumptions which are there. Um, in addition to the EROI, there is another uh, EPBT which is basically energy payback time. So, if we look at the total amount of embodied energy in let us say a solar PV module and see how much time does it take for us to generate that much energy. So, in the 1970s and 1980s the energy payback periods of photovoltaics was high. Uh, which meant that uh, it would take a large, num large number of years uh, for that energy to pay back. Um, and for any new uh, source which we consider as renewable, we can calculate this and see whether or not it is viable. So, apart from EROI, we have another index called the energy payback period. So, this is from an NREL report. You can see this uh, um, NREL, uh, if you look at this document, it shows you the kind of energy payback periods for the entire PV uh, system, which is of the order of um, uh, 3 years or less. And uh, we can look at this data, it happens this way that we put in all the energy in the initial period. This is when we build the PV cells, the balance of systems and then you get the returns over the years and then that is that gives you the. So, when we look at the earliest uh, environmental impact, uh, systematic environmental impact of uh, photovoltaic was done by Alcema and you can look at this paper in 2000. Start with the raw materials, go to the material processing, the manufacturing, the use, the decommissioning and as well as some of it is recycled and the treatment and disposal. And with this, the energy payback periods that were done for rooftop and ground mounted systems, of course, this will depend on the solar insulation and the efficiencies. And based on this, you can see that these payback periods are of the order of 2 to 3 years, again depending on the kind of assumptions. You can look at this paper. And this will give you, based on this, we can also look at um, the GHG emissions. And you can see, we had seen this in the initial phase where we talked about the Kaya identity and we said that renewables are an option for us to reduce the GHG emissions. We said uh, as compared to 1 kg of CO2 per kilowatt hour roughly for coal, when we talk of all the renewables, they are all in the range of uh, 20, 30 grams per kilowatt hour. And so, this is, these numbers are got from this life cycle analysis and one may look at this in a little more detail. Uh, there is a recent report uh, from the European Union which talks about the energy payback period of the recent cells, again with different kinds of efficiencies, monocrystal silicon, if you see, it turns out to be uh, of the order of about 2 years. And then um, uh, the uh, similar things, you can look at multi-silicon, cadmium telluride and, and so on. And this, this also gives you an idea of the total carbon footprint. We have uh, later, I will show you uh, some numbers that we have done for an Indian context on a similar basis. Uh, when we look at the final uh, life cycle analysis, uh, normally, you can actually uh, use um, your own calculations. You can do this on uh, with an Excel spreadsheet or you can use MATLAB. Uh, many, uh, many of the researchers do use software for LCA and there are a number of software, Sima Pro, Gabi. Some of them are uh, uh, public domain software like Open LCA. The advantage of the software often is also that they have databases which are available for different kinds of materials and that will enable, that reduces the kind of time that you need to make the analysis. Uh, please also remember that these databases which are there for the embodied energy 
will have assumptions, will be based on a certain kind of mix, will depend on the country for which it is there. So, if you are doing something for India, please make sure you know how that when you use an embodied energy for some materials, find out for which country or context it is there and is in the Indian context is it going to be similar. Um, you will find in, in all of these uh, software, you will find that there are uh, multiple criteria which are uh, calculated including the different kinds of, so there are different environmental emission factors which are uh, there and then the emissions are computed. Um, both local, global. So, you can see there are criteria for global warming which is CO2, N2O, methane, CFC and then this can be converted into a, G, a CO2 equivalent and there are ozone depletion uh, criteria like CFCs, HCFCs and then there are acidifications, SOX, NOX, uh, hydrochloric, hydrofluoric acid, uh, eutrophication and local photochemical smog, all of this the toxicity, all of these parameters are there and one gets um, in the, uh, one gets a whole set of multiple criteria. Now, depending on your application, we have to look at these criteria, see whether they are beyond the limits, compare the criteria across different options and then take, uh, then look at the implication in terms of a decision. Um, so, in many of these cases, so basically what happens is this is a, so this is from the um, IEA's um, assessment, LCS assessment of different sources and you can see uh, what all are the uh, adverse impacts for different kinds of sources and then this, these can be quantified, one can see what kind of trade-offs one can have. Um, similar, this is uh, the LCA assessment report in terms of uh, this is um, <coughs> from the World Energy Council and, and you can see that this has uh, the different kinds of CO2 uh, equivalent, tons of CO2 equivalent per gigawatt hour, uh, gigawatt hour and you can compare the uh, impacts which are there for nuclear, for wind and for photovoltaics. Um, uh, there are, LCA has been traditionally, you, uh, has been very useful in seeing, for instance, when we link, think in terms of replacing oil, we have been thinking in terms of using biofuels. And there are a number of different sources of biofuels. One can use biofuels based on waste. One can also have dedicated plantations for biofuels and uh, several countries including US and Latin America have been having large um, energy plantations and uh, sometimes what happens in these energy plantations is one puts in a significant amount of energy in the, uh, in the fertilizers in the agriculture, in the irrigation and uh, when you look at the overall, it may or may not be net energy positive. So, there have been situations where there, these are subsidized and so it looks like it is a viable option, it is renewable, but when you do the numbers, you find that this is uh, net energy negative. So, this is an example from a report um, which is from science. Uh, where in the state of California, they uh, assess that corn-based ethanol um, is net energy negative and is actually worse than gasoline. Uh, gasoline is the fuel which is used for vehicles in the US and uh, if you look at it, this is the G greenhouse gas emissions from gasoline uh, in terms of equivalent CO2 equivalent per megajoule of the fuel and when we look at corn ethanol, there is a direct emission and then there is an emission which is because of the land use change and when you add this up, you can see that this turns out to be uh, worse. And so, of course, these are uh, 
interesting uh, because in as we will see when we talk about policy analysis, policy makers usually like to have a solution which is a large scale solution. So, we want to have a large amount of uh, corn ethanol or we want to have a large amount of jatropha and then because it seems to be renewable one subsidizes it, but then maybe in some cases this does not result in the impact that you expect and you are actually putting in more energy, uh, you are actually putting in more emissions than you would have done if you just continued with the gasoline case. Uh, so, this is now uh, a, a study for Germany, uh, you can look this is a paper by Cal Smith uh, where the a biofuel rapeseed methyl ester uh, for transport. Uh, is calculated and the way it is calculated you can see the paper to get the numbers, but just to show you what it means is that the total energy that you are getting per hectare uh, and this uh, we are looking at plant production including fertilizer, harvesting, transport, oil extraction and some percentage is going to is attributed to the rapeseed oil which is being used for our fuel and then refining, esterification, some percentage going to be, this is what I meant when we talked about the uh, allocation. So, 96 percent going to this, 4 percent going to the other byproduct glycerin and then final transport. So, the total annual comes to about 16,200 uh, megajoules per hectare and <laughs> if we look at uh, this, so per hectare this is the amount that we will get and this can be compared with the energy content which we are using for diesel and we can then compare these again in terms of the emissions. Uh, uh, so, this comparison which was done in terms of primary energies, this is 16.2, 47.1 uh, is uh, diesel. The CO2 equivalent is 1594, in diesel it's 3752 and so overall you can see there could be in this it's, it looks like um, the, is, this is a, a viable uh, option in terms of at least primarily it passes the test of emissions and uh, energy. So, let us look at now uh, another example which is um, from an Indian context, uh, we had carried out, there was a period when the government was very keen on having large scale Jatropha plantations and at that time we thought that it would be worthwhile, it would be interesting to see. So, there was a, the entire map of India you would see that there was a plan to have a large amount of uh, Jatropha plantations and one of the things which we felt at that time was that one needs to analyze and see whether or not um, this is a viable option. So, this was uh, the work done by one of our students who was interning in summer and we compared both Jatropa and another one which is Karanj. Um, <coughs> Karanj is a seed which is used in uh, often in uh, South India. You can look at Jatropa or Karanj and uh, we start with the first phase which is the agriculture cultivation phase. In the agricultural cultivation phase, there is some energy going into seed bed preparation, sowing, there is some fossil energy going into diesel and electricity and uh, there is energy going into the irrigation and fertilizers and herbicides. So, that is the agricultural cultivation stage. Uh, we then take that and transport and uh, the in transport we are using some fossil and diesel. Then we have the conversion stage where you have the cracking, pressing, filtration, trans esterification and then we have the fossil which is used in vehicle operation stage. And based on this we calculated using the net energy ratio and the net energy ratio this is another energy 
output energy input. And um, in this, uh, we do not take, we are only taking for the energy input, we are not considering the energy that is put in with the biomass, we are only looking at only the fossil input. So, this net energy for it to be viable, the net energy ratio must be greater than 1. <laughs> we can also calculate <coughs> what is the mega joule per kilometer of vehicle driven. We can look at also the costs on a per ton and a per kilometer basis. So, when we did this, if you say this, we had primary energy which was going in here, primary energy going at this point and then we had the transportation and cracking stage and for Jatropa and Karanj. So, we did the life cycle approach uh, and we looked at energy output by energy input, any R greater than 1, the replacement would be viable prima facie, then we have to look at the economics of course, any R less than 1 replacement not viable, then we did the life cycle cost and annualized life cycle cost and calculated. So, we can calculate it based on primary energy, on the renewable energy and secondary. So, you would like to see and the interesting thing is please look at this graph, these are all 2007 values. Uh, you can see that there are different, there are different kinds of combination depending on the yield and depending on the nature of the land. So, if you are using fallow land which has relatively low yields, we need to put in much more of irrigation and fertilizers and there are situations where in, in the case of Jatropa where this is less than 1. So, the other cases where uh, the yields are higher and uh, we can actually get this is without this is without the crow product. Of course, if we uh, if we are using the crow product which is uh, and we can uh, we can actually uh, market that and that has a value then of course, it becomes greater than 1 for all cases. But if we are not using the crow product uh, which is glycerol, uh, then you see that it depends on the kind of land. So, if your yield is high, then of course, we are getting an NER of uh, 3 and uh, in this case, what happens is that uh, thi this is land which is typically fertile land and so there is an issue of food versus fuel. Uh, in the uh, wastelands where we are looking at, if you put Jatropa, you would find that it is not viable, we are putting in much more energy than it requires and then so this is the kind of case. Of course, this is the kind of price that we get and the price is, uh, was, is similar, slightly higher than the price of the fuel that we are getting X refinery at crude. In the case of Karanj, we find that the situation is slightly better, that it is going to be viable in all the cases. Uh, so, what have we looked at? We have looked at life cycle analysis and net energy analysis and we have looked at how to uh, apply these and we have looked at a couple of examples. Uh, in the next module, we will take a few more examples to illustrate uh, the use of net energy analysis and life cycle analysis.